Okay. Uh, many espouse the need for multicultural ministry, but you see the need for ethnic-specific ministries also. Can you mm. explain why? Um, <clears throat> that's a great question. I, I, I think every church, whether it's majority like white, majority black, or multi-ethnic, or whatever it is, every church has, I think, different opportunities, kingdom opportunities. And I think... Uh, particularly the Asian American church has some opportunities that maybe other churches don't. And uh, I would say at least four. Uh, the, the first is um, the Asian American church has the opportunity to provide a place where Asian American Christians can feel at home, right? So um, <clears throat> as I say, as Asian Americans growing up here, uh, we have always felt like we're minorities in someone else's majority culture, right? Uh, Monday through Friday, we're a majority white culture, whether at school or at work, and, and we know we don't belong. We know we're out of place. We know we feel like a minority, right? And I think that's a, that's a common experience for, for all minorities. But I, I think for Asian Americans, uh, even when, like on the weekends, when they go to their Asian American church, or maybe for me, I, I went to a Korean American church. I have both a Korean-speaking ministry and an English-speaking ministry. Even in my... Um, church space I felt like a minority because even in those spaces the majority culture is the first generation Korean speaking Koreans if you know what I mean so they're the ones that are the the, the senior pastor and the elders and and they determine uh, how things are done uh, what the dominant language is and all that and so people like me who are second generation English speaking Korean Americans I can't speak Korean very well even in that space I feel like a minority in someone else's majority culture my parents feel like they belong but, but not me, right? And I think um, <clears throat> churches like ours, which is like English-speaking Asian American churches, we have the opportunity to provide a place where uh, people like me can, can feel like we belong, that, that we're at home, right? For the first time, um, and so I hear this a lot at my church uh, when we have casual conversations or to membership interviews. I can't tell you how many times people have said to me, Pastor Owen, for the first time, I feel like I'm at home. And, and at first when I heard that, I'd be like, oh, that's great, because you are at home, you know, that, that's awesome. But I would hear it over and over again, and I said, I think there's something here. And, and I would have some follow-up conversations with, with, with some more uh, uh, thoughtful and articulate people, and I think what they began to share was, um, uh, I put it this way, for the first time, they get to be a part of majority culture, and they've never experienced that before because they've always been minorities in someone else's majority culture. And now for the first time, they're in a room full of people that look like them. They're, they're part of the numerical majority. They don't stick out. But more than that, I think it's more than just um, a numerical majority. It's about uh, power and position. And, and so for the first time, you look at a senior pastor and he looks like you. Uh, you look at the elders, they look like you. Um, and, and you begin to now see, wow, I think this is a place where I can um, lay down roots and, and raise my family and maybe even begin to serve. These are folks, for example, if they went to, like, say, a majority white church, they can never envision that they might be an elder here. Or if they went to a Korean-speaking church because they can't speak Korean, they would never see themselves as a chang you know, you know in, in a Korean church. And yet for the first time, they're like, hey, someone that looks like me, that can't speak Korean is they're in significant positions of leadership and, and their imagination gets broadened and they can say, I can, this feels like home. For the first time, they feel like they fit in in a way that they've never fed in before. And so I think the Asian American church has the opportunity to provide a place where Asian American Christians can feel at home. Another opportunity is um, uh, contextualized ministry to Asian Americans. And um, as we all know, in the past several years, we've seen... Uh, the rise of uh, anti-Asian uh, racism, hatred, and violence, and, 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 and Asian Americans, like in our day, are now being traumatized by racist encounters, right? And, and, and who's going to minister to them, right? And, um, and so I, I think we have the opportunity to uh, pastorally address unique challenges and struggles that Asian Americans are going through. And so, like, for example, in the context of our church, we were able to hold a night of lament where Asian Americans who can come together and express their anxiety, their fears, their anger, their rage, their confusion. Why is this happening? And, and for us to be able to uh, apply the gospel to hurting people in a very contextualized way, right? And I, and I think um, we, I, we have the opportunity to minister to Asian Americans that maybe majority white culture uh, churches or multi-ethnic churches may not be equipped to do so. 
And so I think that's an opportunity for us. Uh, another opportunity I, I talk about is a leadership development and leadership opportunity. Um, uh, at our church, all of our key visible leaders are Asian American, they're Korean American, and, and they're amazing leaders, right? But sometimes I wonder, would they have these kinds of opportunities to lead if they were at a majority white church or even a multi-ethnic church or, or a KM church, right? Probably not. And yet, they're amazing leaders. And, um, and so I think we, we, we give, so I, I think you guys know this. I, I see this at our, at our church all the time. Uh, Korean Americans who, in their workplaces, are considered quiet, submissive, you know, uh, they never say anything. Why, why are you so quiet at work? And yet when they come to church, something flips, and they're the most loud, gregarious, uh, amiable people you know. And it's just like they just don't have the freedom for that side of their personality to come out in the workplace uh, for, for whatever reason. And they're more fully alive uh, socially at church. And I think for a lot of our people, they like who they are when they're at church better than who they are when they're at work. Now, they're the same people. But I think different contexts allow us different sides of our personality and maybe even our temperament uh, to come out. And, I, and, I, and it just bothers me when people say, oh, you Asians are just so quiet. You're great helpers, but you're not great leaders. No, we're just not in the context where we're given the opportunity to lead. And we have amazing leaders in our church, uh, but unfortunately might not be seen as leaders in other contexts. But we see them as leaders, and they flourish as leaders at, at, at our church. And I also talked about in terms of a, kind of a, the opportunity for lead senior pastors, right? Um, still, I think uh, in our day and age, it's really hard to see an Asian American pastor be tabbed as a, as a senior pastor in non-Asian majority church context, right? So usually, obviously, in the majority white church, is usually going to be a white guy. Majority black church is going to be a black guy, whatever it is. And even in multi-ethnic spaces, it's usually going to be a white lead pastor with a supporting cast of a, you know, assistant, an Asian American pastor or black pastor, right? And, and, and I feel like um, where are our gifted lead pastor pastors? Where are they going to be able to use their gifts to serve the church? And I think the Asian American church has the opportunity to give them those opportunities to use their gifts to serve Christ in the Asian American church. And then lastly, I would say, um, I think just for an effective mission to Asian Americans. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time here, um, but I think, I mean, hopefully this is not a controversial statement, right? Uh, Asian American churches tend to be more effective at reaching other Asian Americans that are either de-churched or unchurched, right? It is, I'm not saying that they're the only people we can reach, but we're probably the best at reaching other Asian Americans, and vice versa. White majority churches are probably more equipped to reach other white people, and, and that's not a bad thing. It's, it just tells me that we need all sorts of churches because different churches reach different types of people. And I thank God that Jesus brings people into his uh, pan-national uh, kingdom through different churches, right? We don't all, there are many different doorways into the kingdom, and each church is a doorway. And, and I think the more doorways we have, the more people can come into the kingdom. And so I think uh, the Asian American church has a unique opportunity uh, to reach de-churched and unchurched Asian Americans with the gospel. And that's a good thing. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let, let's go. I, I heard a lot of uh, talk about leadership in that. Mm. Kind of leadership. And mm. I know we can talk about Cali. Yeah. Um, but I want to know, like, what, how did you get interested in that, in that leadership component? Hmm. What was it for you that said, you know what, we need leaders to be yeah. seen? Was it something that happened at a young hmm. age that, that where you're like, oh, I want to aspire to that? You know what I mean? Uh, that's a great question. Um, uh, how I kind of got into into Cali, which is the Korean American Leadership uh, Initiative, which is a ministry of the Presbyterian Church in America, and we were created to be able to to minister to second generation. Korean American teaching elders and ruling elders. And, and, and here's the truth. We've always had leaders, but many of our leaders were under-resourced, isolated, struggling, um, never appreciated. But we've always, the church has always had leaders. And unfortunately, many of our leaders were unhealthy 
and we've seen some tragic and disastrous results because of unhealthy, isolated, stressed out, burned out, overburdened, under-supported leaders. And so Cali was really started to, uh, to stop the bleeding, if you will, uh, because we believe that when, in our context, if a Korean American church has healthy, uh, spiritually vital, thriving, growing leaders, then that's gonna be good for the church. So we serve the church by serving the leaders of the church. And so if the leaders of the church are in community with other leaders and, and they're experiencing, I, I, you cannot survive in ministry without friends. If you're isolated and, and there's stress and you add time, that is just a recipe for disaster. It is just a matter of time before something very unfortunate happens. Um, ministry will always be stressful, but it becomes more bearable when you do it with friends and with colleagues. And so we want to see Korean American pastors, instead of being so territorial and competitive and suspicious of one another, hey, we're all on the same team. We're, we're, we're not competing against one another. We're, we're complementing one another. We're, we're called to collaborate uh, because we need each other so that we can our ministries and our churches can thrive together. Because at the end of the day, it's not about your church or my church or your brand or my brand. It's about King Jesus and his kingdom and his church. And if you want to serve the kingdom, we, we have to do it together. We can't do it alone. And so we're, we're very intentional about uh, encouraging relationships and friendships among, among pastors, but also resourcing them with um, uh, culturally contextualized ministry training. You know, for people like me, we, we grew up attending all these great conferences, but it's usually led by who? By the white experts, right? And the thing is, they may not know, but they speak from their own context as well. And so what do we have to do? We go and we take, we get this amazing content and we're like, but man, it doesn't really apply in my church situation. And so you have to kind of contextualize it. And you have to say, oh, this, this works, but this doesn't really work. And then you, you have this like Frankenstein thing and then, and then you apply it to your church, um, which is okay. But what if we had the opportunity to now bring in uh, wise, experienced, gifted Asian American church leaders and who can give uh, contextualized training so that it's a direct download, if you will. Uh, you don't have to contextualize anything because it already comes to you contextualized by an older brother or sister that's done ministry in your space. And they know the challenges and the opportunities of your ministry and they're able to speak to that, I think, more clearly and more relevantly. And so that's what we're trying to do. I think one of the things that I know happened to me and happened to a lot of people that are in Asian ethnic churches yeah is there's this feeling that you can't invite non-Asians to church. Yeah. <laughs> but for me, over time, as I've been doing that, I realized it's actually one of the selling points for a lot of people, mm. right? Like I had a pair of uh, black friends that were part of our church, and yeah. later they were like, they, they got burned by black church. Mm. They were not gonna go to white church. And they were see. like, when you said you went to a Korean yeah. church, yeah, they yeah. were like, what is that? Yeah, 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 yeah. In your experience now embracing that, mm -hmm. what are some of the cultural things that Korean American churches excel at mm. that are uniquely appealing even to non-Asians? Wow, that's a great question. That's a great question. And hopefully I can give a thoughtful answer. <laughs> Maybe I can call it strengths or advantages of maybe at least in my context, the Korean American church. Mm -hmm. I think one is we do friendship and community very well. Uh, there's a, a thick community. Um, um, and so I think there's the opportunity to uh, show um, the world what um, an alternate community shaped by the gospel uh, as experienced by Asian Americans can look like. You know, I, I think uh, as at least at our church, we're not just a church that just gets together once a week on Sundays just to be in the same room to worship together. No, no, I mean, during the week, we're in community groups together, there's friendships, uh, people golf together, they eat together, they do life together, uh, because church is not just a spiritual place, it's also a social and cultural place, for, at least for us. And, and I think uh, we want to celebrate that, and I don't think we should be apologetic that your best friends are people that you go to church with. In fact, don't we want that, right? And so I think we, uh, we have the opportunity to do that. Um, I think uh, there's just so many wonderful things about the Korean American church. I think another thing is um, uh, this understanding. I think it kind of comes, this is what we learned from our first generation Korean American uh, 
uh, churches, the idea that the, you, when you serve the Lord, it requires sacrifice. You, you don't just serve when it's easy or comfortable or convenient, but this a willingness to, to, to suffer and to sacrifice for the sake of the ministry is something I think that's beautiful. Now, of course, it can be abused, but if it's motivated by the gospel for the glory of Christ and not for you know, man's applause or whatever it is, I think that's a beautiful thing that we can steward um, and, and to show uh, uh, Jesus is worth sacrificing for. Jesus is worth inconveniencing ourselves for. So um, I wish I had some better answers to that, but I, but I, but I think uh, there are, no, don't get me wrong, there are some really problematic things <laughs> about the Korean American church that we need to reject, right? <laughs> Uh, and, and then there are some things that uh, uh, we don't do very well, but we need to redeem. But I think there are so many things that, that we do do well that we can uh, celebrate, right? And I think uh, we want to be thoughtful because not everything in the Korean American church is good. Some right. things need to be rejected. Um, right? And as we move kind of into the second, third, maybe yeah. the fourth generation yeah. of Korean American yeah. church, um, you know, one of the things that I think happens is we kind of, forget that the Korean American church existed before us. Yeah, right? yeah, that's Everyone right. Everyone feels like they're doing it for the first yeah, time. Yeah, that's right, that's right. What are some of the stories of the Korean American church from like the 60s, 70s, 80s mm. that you've begun to learn where you're like, wow, I wish we taught, I wish we celebrated these things, I wish we remembered these things that kind mm. of inform your identity now of what Korean American church mm. is. We're going to be able to edit stuff like this, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Man, these are some great questions. I wish you would have given me some lead time. So, uh, so, so, I just want to know. I just Yeah, I mean, I'd love to give some more thoughtful answers. That's, that's a great question. Um, and I'm not very good at thinking on, on, on my feet here, but um, uh, gosh. Um, first of all, that's a very uh, humbling thing to realize, that you're not the first on the scene. That you, when, even when we're here, we're standing on someone else's shoulders, right? And, and it would behoove us, wisdom would behoove us to say, hey, we, we need to learn from our spiritual fathers and mothers who have gone before us, right? Um, gosh, uh, their commitment to prayer, uh, dependence on God in a way that, um, I, I think the immigrant generation had like a palpable, um, existential, need for God to survive. That I think for those of us who are second generation, we don't experience that quite as much because we were educated and, and we have so many of the benefits and advantages of knowing the system where I, I feel like, man, our parents came and they didn't know the language, they didn't have relationships with families, and yet they, they survived. And I think when you're in that situation, there is like a purity and an earnestness of faith. That's a beautiful thing. And I think sometimes for us, uh, we do far more planning than trusting, right? Uh, we, we know how to plan and we try to have contingency plans. And so we think we, if we have like a, a, a foolproof plan that things should go well. And then our faith functionally is more in our planning than in our God, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I think there's something about that kind of radical faith that we can learn from our uh, spiritual forefathers and, and foremothers. And, um, Man, I, I, I wish I could think more about this question. I want, I want to give you a thoughtful answer. I'm sorry I can't do it, but oh, no. this is a great question. We'll, yeah. get, we'll get an article for it. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> send it to Adam. Send it to Adam. I could ask questions all day. Yeah. Well, I think we've got time for one more. Yeah. Okay. Give me so, a softball, bro. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. What would you say? Well, this is how we'll end it. Yeah. What would you say to Asian American leaders who are in immigrant churches or mm. Asian American churches who feel that their ministries are a little less than because it's not majority culture or multicultural for that matter? Yeah. Man. Uh, that's a very personal question because that's something that I struggled with for a long time. Mm -hmm. Um uh, there was a time when I believed that serving in an Asian American church or my Korean American church was somehow what I would call junior varsity. Uh, but you know, serving at a, a white church, you know, white mega church for that matter, would be varsity. For example, my dream job was one day if I could work at Redeemer Presbyterian Church with Dr. Tim Keller, then I know I've made it, right? <laughs> and, and this uh, over elevating and overvaluing uh, of white majority churches, and, and at the same time, an undervaluing. Of, of the uh, 
minority church. And, and I would just say, um, your church that you serve at is not less than anything. Um, your church is beautiful and precious to Jesus. He bled for your church. And how dare you view this church that Jesus loves so much as somehow less than, right? Um, in Genesis 1, we're told when after God created all things, after God created humans in his, own image, in his own image, he said, it is very good. And what that means is when we look at another human being who are created in the image of God, no matter what the color of their skin is, no matter what their ethnicity is, we ought to say, we must say, it is very good. And, and what applies to individual humans applies to a community of humans, which is what a church is, and to say, you are very good. And we need to be able to say that about every church, right? White churches, black churches, Hispanic churches, Asian churches, multi-ethnic churches, they are all very good. And so we don't want to go to the other side and, and start to believe that our churches are superior to other churches. That's the other side of the mistake here. But we should never, ever feel like we're somehow less than. Um, God created us with our skin color, with our ethnicity, and God did not make a mistake. It's something good to be celebrated.